Doris Cordell served 19 years as a judge, including over a dozen on the Superior Court of California, author of Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, How to Change It. Harry Littman served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice, is now a legal affairs columnist for the Los Angeles Times, and both join me now. Judge Cordell, let me start with you because I'm particularly interested in how you think of this as a judge. I mean, there is a lot of discretion given to judges over the timing of these things. Um, you have a, a very unusual case here for a number of reasons, not just the ex-president who's been indicted, but the campaign calendar. How do you think is a fair way to evaluate a schedule, and how would you be approaching it were you this judge? Uh, no trial judge with any experience who has assigned a case this uh, gathering this much attention, such a high-profile trial, would ever do anything in a haphazard manner. So when Judge Chutkin came forward and said the trial date is March the 4th, you better believe that she gave it a lot of thought. Uh, she has experience as a public defender, so she understands what defense attorneys have to deal with in terms of going through documents. But be sure she gave a, a lot of deliberation to this, and I bet you she consulted, she may have consulted with other judges on the bench to kind of put together what is the fairest way for both sides, understanding full well that the defense is entitled to due process, the time to put the case together. So when she came out with this, it wasn't like, oh, come out on the bench and, oh, I'll just have right. a compromise date between what each side wants. That did not happen. Trust me, she put in a lot of thought uh, in coming up with this trial date. And it's a date that's firm. Now, will it change? It could. Someone could get sick. The Things can happen. But if the date is changed, it isn't going to be changed to two years out. Yeah, this is, she said this um, uh, during those, uh, those arguments. She said this to John Laurel. I will say, you and I have a very, very different estimate of the time that's needed to prepare for this case. But Mr. Trump will be treated exactly with no more or less deference than any other defendant would be. Um, Laurel, at one point, and, and, and Harry, I'd love to get your response to this, seems to be sort of flagging an issue for appeal, right, already in this hearing. Um, he says, we will not be able to provide adequate representation to a client who has been charged with serious offenses as a result of that trial date. The trial date will deny President Trump the opportunity to have effective assistance of counsel in light of the enormity of this case. Of course, effective assistance of counsel is something that you can use for a, a post-conviction appeal. What do, you, what do you think about him using that language in that context, Harry? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And he was already in a bit of a hole uh, with her in this hearing. She said twice, turn down the temperature, and he had proffered that outlandish uh, proposal to go two years out. So he is, without doubt, saying to her, you are violating the Constitution, Your Honor. Of course, we, we will comply, but you're violating the Constitution, and we're going to bring this to the Court of Appeals. All of those things. I really want to second one thing that, the, that Judge Cordell just said. Remember the very first day how there were several judges of that court who showed up, including the chief judge. I think it's quite clear that the whole court here, each of which has dealt with hundreds of cases under uh, and, and has been including appeals, is really cohesive and thinking yeah. together of this as a kind of test of the court. And she absolutely can rely on her colleagues to reach a considered decision of what will hold up uh, against a court of appeals. The final thing is to say that while she did note the speedy trial interest, it's clear she led, again, as the judge has just indicated, with the, the due process rights of the defendant. She's not going to get in the trap of suggesting that they are they are pushed back it be behind below yeah. the due process line because of the need for speed that comes first and that's just what she said so so judge you said you know so i've been talking to lawyers right and one of the things that that is is notable right is things get delayed all the time i mean it, it, this stuff can move very slowly right and it could be any number of reasons right one of the lawyers had heart surgery or you know i mean there's a whole bunch of things that can happen right it, what, what's clear here, what's evident to everyone, and I think Judge Chutkin has been very clear about this, is there's a strong public, public interest in a swift trial. Donald Trump and his lawyers don't want a swift trial, right? So the question now is, like, what, what can they do to throw sand in the gears? What, are, how would you, what would you be anticipating if you sure. were that judge? Sure. When a judge presides over pretrial motions, it's the opportunity for the trial judge to size up who the parties are. 
How are they going to behave? Who's going to engage in theatrics? Who's going to be rude or maybe not want to follow the orders? And what I did on the bench when I had a high-profile case and I knew that there were some issues, I, I, and I, this is what I do, you have the talk. Uh, it's the judicial talk. Hmm. And the talk is very simple. You look the litigants and the lawyers, all of them dead in the eye, and you say to them, and this is what I did when I presided over cases, I am going to give you the fairest trial you have ever had. And you are going to give me your respect and you're going to follow my orders. Are we clear? And generally I would hear from both sides, yes, your honor, then we would move on. So it may be soon that Judge Chutkin, when these attorneys start again uh, about maybe the trial date, to have the talk, the judicial talk. Uh, it certainly worked for me, and I'm not the only person, only judge who has done this, especially when you're a female judge, who sometimes we don't get the respect we should mm. be getting, as opposed to a male judge, and also being a judge of color. So when you, this combination is such that we have to make sure we are in control of the proceedings. So I encourage the judge, if she has to do so, and maybe she's already done it, to have the talk hmm. early on. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems, I mean, she has, by all accounts, and I have not been in that courtroom, seemed to really control control the space authoritatively. Obviously, there's a judge who is both respected and has some real, I mean, real experience. This is, you know, Judge Eileen Cannon down in, in Florida is going to be providing over her third criminal trial or something like that. So this is a totally different universe. I guess I, what I keep coming back to, Harry, and, and you said this and, um, you know, other, other folks have said this. I, I've been, you know, watching coverage about this. That Like, this is pretty hard. It's pretty set in stone. It might slip for small logistical reasons. What's, what are they going to try to do to make that not be the case? There are two kinds of delays, Chris. One would be the week at a time. Someone's, you know, uh, just had an emergency surgery or this very motion, or we want an evidentiary hearing. And I think this March date builds in some of that, a month, two months, and still the nation's very strong interest in having a verdict before election is served. The big uh, way of eating up time is an appeal. And that, for example, I think will be happening in Fulton County, where removal motions and you and you yeah. can bet that Trump will bring it at the last minute are appealable. But the different um, actions to challenge the whole case here that Lauro has telegraphed, that it's uh, pretextual, that it's a reprisal for Hunter Biden, that Trump has immunity, none of them. Uh, at least has um, automatic right of appeal. It will be up to Chutkin. So assuming she's a strong gatekeeper huh. here, then I think they have to go in little bite-sized chunks, and that can't get them far enough. So the big issue is, can they get an interlocutory appeal to the Court of Appeals? Even then, by the way, the Court of Appeals, I think, is primed for, for Trump's delaying tactics. But absent that, there just is no, I don't yeah. think they're going to be able to really eat up a lot of time. Yeah, get an interlocutory appeal with a, a, an appeal by right pre pre trial, right? Like, that, can they find something that gets Which I them think there? They do not have, but discretionary interlocutory appeals if Chutkin agrees. Yeah, interesting. And, yeah. All right, yeah. Ladoris Cordell uh, and Harry Lippman, thank you both. Appreciate it.